Warning, this week's episode contains thought crimes, also profanity. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com, Allbirds, Adam and Eve, and by the new backwards-running wristwatch for today's America, the Chapel Watch. The Chapel Watch, taking the smart out of smartwatch. And now, The Scathing Atheist. I'm Matthew Austin, and as a resident of Britain, birthplace of Charles Darwin and also home of Brexit and Boris bloody Johnson, I can assure you we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men, though some of us haven't evolved that far, apparently. It's May 12th. And it's International Respect for Chickens Month. Absolutely. Respect the cluck out of those chickens. I'm no <laughs> illusions. I'm Elon Bosnick. Cluck. I'm Heath Enright. And from Samuel Alito's New Jersey, Ooh. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Lake <laughs> Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the Supreme Court demands privacy while they destroy your right to it. The GOP does linear algebra on cum vectors to define baby murder. <laughs> and Heath will once again answer the age-old question of, what's that smell? But first, the diatribe. So Andrew, Lucinda, and I are walking around downtown Ontario in an increasingly frenzied effort to get a professionally administered COVID test. You need one to fly back to the U.S., and though we were led to believe it was going to be easy to do at any pharmacy in the city, we were finding that not to be the case. This one couldn't get us in until the next day. This one didn't administer tests on the weekends. This one's pharmacist got killed by a moose that very morning. And the whole time, the clock is ticking ever closer to the time that we've got to be at the fucking theater to set up for the show. Finally, we find a place that can get us in in half an hour, and then we've got to wait 20 minutes for the results. So we get our results. Negative. Hooray. But we're up against it time-wise. So we're practically jogging back to the hotel. And as though we were trapped in a goddamn sitcom, suddenly a parade shows up out of nowhere and blocks the route to our hotel for a dozen blocks in either direction. Now, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't just barge through the middle of a parade. I lived in New York City for almost a decade. As John Stewart once said, New York's is a parade-based economy. I'm used to finding my way around giant lines of obstruction. But in this instance, A, I was in a super big fucking hurry, and B, the parade was a full-on gong celebration of World Fool-On Day. That's actually tomorrow, though, so I guess this was the only time that they could get permission to block the streets. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I was damned if I was going to be late to my own show out of respect for a fucking weird-ass alien cult of homophobic fascists, so we just pushed through the fucking parade. Now, of course, I'm fully expecting to unleash the floodgate. Like, generally, in situations like this, as soon as one guy does it, everybody does it. Or at least that's how it works in the good old U.S. of A. But we weren't in the U.S. of A. We were in Canada a country that, at least in my experience, lives up to its reputation for politeness. So instead of that, I just got a bunch of people giving me that I bet he's an American look. And a quick glance around, it's it's obvious why, right? Like, I know what Falun Gong is. They don't. You know, they just see a bunch of Chinese people celebrating a holiday they've never heard of, carrying signs that say stop Chinese communism and handing out pamphlets about proper breathing techniques. They see some exotic ceremony that highlights the diversity of their city, and they relish the opportunity for cultural exposure that it provides. And then they see me as some insensitive American jackass who can't spare five minutes to respect another nation's tradition. Now, my first instinct was to fucking plead my case, right? I just wanted to scream out, it's okay to disrespect them. They're a crazy-ass cult that forbids their followers from using medicine and says that Donald Trump is a literal angel from heaven, But I can't because I'm in a hurry. So I just walk away looking like an asshole because I was the more informed party. And later on, as we're Ubering to the venue, it occurred to me how that single moment is sort of a perfect encapsulation of my entire fucking career. Hell, it's a pretty fitting metaphor for all of atheist activism. If you think about it, society tells us to be respectful of everyone's beliefs, but we know enough to see the harm in doing so. And of course, because 
the people selling the bullshit religions also have their hands on the cultural steering wheel. We're always left looking like assholes and wishing that we had more one on one time to explain ourselves. I mean, full on gong is about as far from harmless as a religion can get. These are the motherfuckers behind the epic times. We're talking about a faith whose adherents are constantly dying of treatable illnesses out of a sense of piety. Their leader claims to be a psychic god man that can enter into his followers' minds and punish them in the afterlife for doubting him. But none of that shit was on the fucking pamphlet, of course. Right? Like their public facing side is all about the importance of stillness and good posture and shit. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that all religions are the same as this dangerous cult. Yes, they are all dangerous. They're not equally dangerous, and they're not dangerous in the same way. The distinction between a cult and a religion is very important, even if we should be fighting against both. All that being said, this particular strategy is hardly unique to cults. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, uh, the Mormons used to run these TV commercials about the importance of forgiveness and shit, right? Like, dude would spray a bicyclist with mud as he drove by, and then the bicyclist happens by him broken down up the road and helps him fix his car anyway. And that's the end. It would just say, like, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, I, I didn't know how desperately that church needed to massage its image at that time. I was just a kid. But reflecting back on it now, the ads damn near ended saying, see, we're more than just polygamy. We're regular Christian stuff, too. And and for some reason, this shit works on people. Yeah, not just dumb fucking people, people who are savvy enough to see around the crumbs of philanthropy that billionaires sweep off their table now and again. People shrewd enough to divide the billion that Walmart gave to charity last year by the 572 billion it didn't. People who fully recognize that BP changing to a green logo didn't improve the fucking environment. Somehow these same people will hear us talking about the harm that churches do and they'll say, but what about the money they raise for the homeless? Who fucking cares? That's image enhancing bullshit at the periphery of their faith. And those same people would hear me make this point and try to argue that I'm talking about two distinct groups of people, right? The religious people that do the harm and the ones that do the good. But if the latter empowers the former, why would it even matter? Yeah, I feel like the person in charge of coordinating Walmart's charitable donations is probably a genuinely good person who takes a lot of pride in their work and really believes in what they're doing. But so fucking what? But, you know, even that is being too kind to religion because, like, at least Walmart actually gives away the fucking money. But the churches that preach about forgiveness and acceptance and universal love are the very same churches that ostracize LGBTQ people, demonize immigrants and otherize everybody else. Their outward focus on charity and good works is the hold message telling you that the call they're ignoring is very important to them. And for way too many people, no amount of evidence to the contrary will ever convince them otherwise. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the nocturnal and diurnal to my crepuscular Heath Edright and Eli <laughs> Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to make a day of it? You know what? I rotated around. I'm actually doing the Da Vinci system right now. <laughs> ah, going pretty mm. great. I'm also reading lots of David Foster Wallace, just so everybody knows. I'm the fucking worst. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why I say, I say things like that. Sorry. I was just going to say, if you, I feel like if your language ends up with diurnal, meaning daytime, you should scrap it and start over, right? Something's going yeah, wrong. There's a lot of reasons why we should just, <laughs> right, yeah. And before we move on, of course, I want to remind everybody once more that we're right in the middle of our Matreon pledge drive. This is the Ooh. time of year where we remind everybody that the reason we're still here nine years on is because of our Patreon donors. So if you want longer shows, optional ads, bonus content, and access to our exclusive patron-only annual pajama party live stream, now would be a great time to pledge or increase your pledge. Check the show notes for links to more information. And with that pitch out of the way, it's time for another pitch, this time from our first sponsor this week, Stamps.com. I'm telling you, dude, they taste just like beef jerky. No, they don't. Stop saying things taste just like things they don't taste like. Hey, guys, what you doing? Eli's planning to poison us. No, no, I'm not. I'm just getting ready for the Matreon vegan snack tasting. Like I said. Oh, you mean the Matreon goal where if we get enough new and upgrading members, Heath and I have to do a vegan snack tasting? Did we agree to that? That's right. I'm shipping them to the house now so I don't accidentally get hungry and eat them. <laughs> what I can't figure out, though, is the postage. Well, Eli, why don't you just try stamps.com? Oh, what's stamps.com? You can use stamps.com to mail and ship and get access to exclusive discounts and great rates on shipping from USPS and UPS. It's an easy way to keep more money in your pocket. Really? How does it work? 
Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer. And you get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 30% off USPS rates and up to 86% off UPS. It's true. We use Stamps.com to ship our Patreon rewards. Because whether you're an office sending invoices, an Etsy shop sending your products, or a warehouse shipping out truckloads of orders, Stamps.com is the mailing and shipping solution for you. Start mailing and shipping with Stamps.com and keep more money in your pocket every day. Sign up with the promo code SCATHING for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code SCATHING. Thanks, Noah. So uh, what kind of snacks are you packing anyway? Oh, a whole bunch. Uh, like these ones, Cheez-Its. Oh, I, I actually like Cheez-Its. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I mispronounced it. It's uh, Chia-Zits. Yeah, going to murder you and put you in the box. Don't. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, in leaking out my asshole news. You probably missed it because it was overshadowed by the amazing news of our Toronto live show. Mm -hmm. But someone leaked that the Supreme Court is planning to overturn Roe versus Wade. And you know what that means. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. Christians all over the nation lost their goddamn minds. Now, I should point out that's not because of the 50 years of precedent that's being overturned. Mm -mm. Not that now that they've succeeded in taking away rights from women that their grandmothers had. Oh, no, no, no. They freaked out that someone broke the news with, you know, plenty of time for people to get pissed before the midterms and donate to get out the vote efforts so that women of color can save democracy again. So... That's the freakouts we're going to be talking about. Yeah. No, the last time I saw Republicans this concerned about leaks, they were coming from Russian prostitutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So first up, we have Reverend Albert Moeller, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, who had this to say, quote, the release of this draft is dirty pool. It's horribly unethical. Who talks like dirty pool? <laughs> <laughs> With a capital T and that rap. Get out of here. <laughs> There hasn't been a breach of the court's prize confidentiality and protocol like this in any recent memory, probably in all of American history, even the history of the Supreme Court, end quote. Is that is the history of the Supreme Court somehow greater than the history of America? In a, <laughs> so, yeah, few things more important to the Supreme Court than checks notes. Confidentiality? <laughs> <laughs> this court has lost its legitimacy. I feel like the pinky swear not to peek behind the wrapping paper before Christmas is small potatoes in comparison, no? Yeah, I get it, though. Here I was, assuming Samuel Alito was doing a lot of writing essays about feminism and, you know, <laughs> blogging about sourdough starter yeah, and right. stuff like that. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> now I know he's a bad guy. Also, fun fact, the last time that there was a leak out of the Supreme Court, it was a conservative justice leaking the votes for Roe versus Wade. That is a fun fact, oh, a little side note there. Yeah. So some Christians relied on quelling the fears of their opponents, like focus on the family representative, Kelly Rosati, who said, quote, the leak is a stunning breach. The substance of the purported early draft is not surprising. <laughs> wait, wait, purported? I feel like she was watching Law and Order and she just said stuff she heard Sam Watterson say there. <laughs> the, the alleged time dimension and its so-called position of earliness in that. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> she continues, Roe being overturned won't make abortion illegal. Uh, um, literally, we'll do that in 13 states, minute one of day one and counting yeah. those states. Probably going to be bigger. States will act to protect unborn babies or abortion rights. Congress may act. No matter what, we must better support women with unexpected pregnancies, end quote. And, and hey, in case you think Kelly doesn't mean that, she really does, guys, because she then immediately shot herself in the oh, head. Jesus so she really, Christ. yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Bullets don't kill people. Lack of oxygen to the brain does that. So exactly. Not... <laughs> yeah. Still, the less moderate voices of the party had some... I'm going to go ahead and say completely batshit theories to share, like Christian nationalist and show favorite Josh Bernstein, who said, quote, who leaked this information? Isn't it interesting that the child predator lover, right, the black militant leftist who hates white people and loves every single child sexual predator she's ever had in front of her, Katanji Brown Jackson, isn't what? it interesting that for the first time in history, we have a Supreme Court leak of a draft opinion. Could it have been her? 
Possibly. So I, 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 I possible in a like a multiverse sense of the term, I guess. But since <laughs> in this universe, at least, she's not on the fucking court yet. Not so much, bro. He didn't know she's not okay. On the court. Okay, she was doing a follow shift, not getting tips. <laughs> Probably mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> Makes perfect sense. That's how that works in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Just doing Alito's roll-ups. <laughs> but don't worry, there's more. He continued, quote, Or perhaps maybe it was the Puerto Rican socialist Sonia Sotomayor. She's from New York. Another one who hates this country. And let's not forget the communist Jew, right? <laughs> Elena Kagan. Yeah, she's also from New York. He didn't say that. Okay, <laughs> he makes the distinction that Sotomayor is a socialist and Kagan is a communist. I mean, uh, that's a good distinction. He definitely knows what those words mean. That's oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So he, he concludes, so I think it was probably one of these three evil bitches, if you want to know the truth. So Republicans should go in there immediately and confiscate these three judges' email communications, hard drives, uh -huh. computers, uh -huh. laptops, phones, find out who this leaker is, and charge them with treason, end quote. Well, yeah, because otherwise the Supreme Court could lose its confidentiality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One last one I want to include in here, and that, of course, is the reaction of Reverend Robert Jeffress, who's been on this show a time or two. Well, he's been mentioned on the show a time or two. <laughs> yep. yeah. yeah. And uh, here's what he had to say, quote, Roe is collapsing and millions of lives will be saved because of the millions of evangelicals who voted in 2016 for a president who kept his word, end quote. I'd also like to add a big thanks to everyone who hated Donald Trump, but didn't help stop him in any way, said the Christian right bigot whilst gloating about forcing people to birth a child. Yep. Yeah. Think about yeah. that. Yeah. That one's from Robbie Jeff. And in Erections Have Consequences news, if you're thinking that after the Supreme Court dismantles abortion rights and sets us back 50 years, the Republican Party is going to be done establishing theocratic rules that take away uterine autonomy. Uh, one, you should read the news. Mm -hmm. And two, <laughs> I have a really cool JPEG of a monkey to sell you. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Your monkey. $200 billion. And here's an example of that news you should read. GOP U.S. Senate candidate Blake Masters of Arizona, who looks like his name is Blake Masters. <laughs> You're picturing it correctly. He announced on his website... Last week, that he'll only vote to confirm federal judges who support removing the right to use birth control. Okay. Now, Heath, if you look like the son that Slenderman got off on sexual harassment charges, you'd be against birth <laughs> control, too. <laughs> Blake Masters is the reason for birth control. This yeah. is very personal to him. I get it. God. Yeah. A lot of the Republican agenda at this point reads like revenge against those of us who are getting laid, doesn't it? <laughs> Don't it, though? So... Here's what it said on the campaign website for Masters. Quote, I am 100% pro-life. Roe v. Wade was a horrible decision. It was wrong the day it was decided in 1973. It's wrong today, and it must be reversed. But the fight doesn't stop there. I will vote only for federal judges who understand that Roe and Griswold and Casey huh? were wrongly decided and that there is no constitutional right to abortion, end quote. Just to be clear, Roe and Casey are Supreme Court cases that affirm the right to terminate a pregnancy. Griswold was the case that struck down a Connecticut law against birth control for being unconstitutional, because obviously it was unconstitutional. Okay, so on the bright side, a senatorial candidate who's planning to keep us from codifying Roe might just be insanely ignorant, everybody. You might, yeah. A, but, but regardless, the court already decided in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby that all it takes to transform contraception into abortion is your boss's sincerely held religious belief. That's precedent now. So yeah, I'm not even sure they need to go after Griswold. Oh, God damn it. Can we do it the other way, though? Right? Like we just give out plan B and we're like, nom, 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 nom. now it's plan C. <laughs> That's a church. There yeah, you go. No. We'll make a flag. And <laughs> just in case it wasn't already clear that the Republican Party is 100% conspiring to take over every uterus in America. Yes, they are. That's not hyperbole. Here's how we know. First of all, the moment that someone noticed the quote on Blake Master's website and made it national news, he deleted the whole thing. He also went on Twitter and made accusations that there was a violation of journalistic ethics that led to it coming out. What? And when asked, do, do you want to elaborate on that? He said, 
Long pause, no. <laughs> and when reporter H.B. Enright asked, how the fuck is quoting a public website a violation of journalistic <laughs> integrity? He said, long pause, still more long pause. My answer is long pause. You can't see <laughs> And most importantly, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, that's the body that tells GOP Senate candidates what to do, they have an official set of guidelines that says almost, quote, Yes, of course, we're going to try to take away the right to birth control. But we don't just say it out loud, you dumb fuck. We're conspiring. Read a conspiracy. <laughs> they have that. Code your statement into a corporate logo or a Beyonce video, would you? Act like a fucking professional, man. <laughs> don't read our websites. Don't stand outside of our houses. I feel like these guys <laughs> should maybe spend some time in literally any other historical period <laughs> and realize how easy they have it. <sighs> we got to yeah. get that time machine going again. Originally, the guillotine was made because it was less cruel. You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> now they'd let me make it. <laughs> and just in case anyone wasn't clear on this, yeah, it goes without saying, but birth control doesn't kill a baby. Nope. Neither does abortion. But nope. even if you believe killing a baby is a reasonable way to describe abortion, that's insane. But even if you believe that, birth control does that in the same way that menstruation kills a baby or faster swimming sperm kill the future baby of slower swimming <laughs> sperm or Kevin Costner diving in front of cum as it flies in the general direction of a uterus kills a baby while Whitney Houston sings in... You're really yeah, kind of interesting sexual scenario that I'm describing. Eve, uh, what, uh, what I'm saying is <laughs> people with a uterus should be able to go on Cameo and use government issued debit cards to hire Kevin Costner to bodyguard against flying cum. What? And they should also be able to do any number of other things that kill a baby with all different levels of dramatic flair, whatever the fuck they want. And if you have any questions about exactly how they want to do that, the answer is shut the fuck up. There shut you the go. Fuck up. Dr. Nunya. <laughs> All right. Well, we've obviously got to talk to Kevin Costner's people. So we're going to pause for a quick word from our second sponsor this week, Allbirds. And this is the backup pair to my backup pair. Oh, that's smart. See, I've only got the one backup. Right. Hey, guys. Uh, what you doing? Oh, hey, Eli. We're getting ready for the pajama party week. Marsh is coming. Oh, that's right. I'm looking forward to that. Well, but so is his wife. Nicola? She's... She's awesome. What's the problem yeah, with that? Uh... She's awesome. But it means at some point we'll have to try to walk as fast as she does, probably. Oh, damn. I hadn't thought of that. She's so fast. Right? I heard one time she was late for a doctor's appointment and she accidentally spun the earth the wrong direction like Superman trying to save Lois Lane. Did Superman save Lois Lane? Yeah. I heard she was trying to find her seat at a track meet and she accidentally took first place in the 100 meter dash from the bleachers. Mm -hmm. That's true. That was in the paper. I saw that. But guys, guys, if you need a shoe to help keep up with Nicola's unearthly walking speed, why don't you try all birds? Oh, like we have all the birds attack her? Or, or pull her in the other direction to slow her down. Yeah. <laughs> no, sillies. All birds create shoes and clothing that are better for you and better for the planet using a revolutionary roster of premium natural materials like their popular tree runner sneaker. Why is it called the tree runner sneaker? Because it's made from eucalyptus tree fiber, a lightweight, breathable, and silky soft material. The Tree Runner is the perfect everyday shoe for getting the most out of sunny days. Or for trying to keep up with Barry Allen's illegitimate daughter. Exactly. Albert sent us a pair to try, and they're Anna's favorite walking around shoe. Yeah, mine too. They're light and breathable, but they provide the support I need. All right, I'm sold. Where do I get a pair? Find your new favorite shoes for sunny days and upcoming travel at allbirds.com. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S dot com. I heard that when she walked down the aisle, she accidentally beat Marsh up to the front and they had to like do the whole wedding over. I heard that too. I also heard that. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes her a slut, right? Hey, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. It's not that I'm done talking about the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. It's not remotely that. I have a sneaking suspicion I'll be talking about that for the rest of my goddamn life. But it's not the only thing that's going on in terms of theocratic misogyny. So we have to talk about some other shit, too. So let's start in Afghanistan, shall we? It was clear for years that the people who stood to lose the most from the U.S. withdrawal were the nation's women. They were pretty much immediately ousted from any conceivable position of power when the Taliban retook the national government, but nobody had any illusions that it would end there. 
And we were reminded of that last Saturday when they issued a new proclamation that forced women back into the all-encompassing burqas they'd so recently escaped. According to the proclamation, only a woman's eyes can be showing in public. No more tempting innocent Muslim men with lascivious cheekbones and salacious foreheads. There might be at least a semblance of good news here, though. It looks like this edict, along with one a few months ago, barring girls from attending school beyond the sixth grade, might be causing an internal rift within the ruling party. It's not like there's a wing of the Taliban that is sympathetic to women's rights or anything, but there is a wing that wants Western aid more than they want to oppress half the population. And after 20 years of relative freedom during the war, there's a very real possibility that any fracture within the Taliban could cause the whole thing to come crashing down and a more moderate government to grow in its place. And while that might seem hopelessly optimistic, it's at least a real enough possibility that the Taliban are worried about it. Of course, if the Taliban does fall from power, it's probably only a matter of time before we overtake them in the theocratic misogyny standings. And as if to remind the world what American women have to look forward to if the batshit Christians manage to consolidate power, we were treated to a story this week about a student at a Christian music college in Tennessee who apparently was punished for having premarital sex after she reported being raped. At least that's the claim in the complaint she filed with the U.S. Department of Education a couple weeks ago. Now, to be clear, the premarital sex in question wasn't the rape. The school is accusing her of having had sex with her ex-boyfriend, which she denies. And apparently they threatened to expel her if she didn't sign a confession admitting to the charge. As it stands, they're allowing her to finish her degree remotely. But they also refuse to remove the alleged rapist from her classes, refuse to conduct a Title IX investigation, and tried to bar her from telling anyone else about the rape. So it might not be exactly the story that you thought it was when you first heard it, but it's at least exactly as bad. So, yeah, it was nice when I needed more in the way of transitional material to move from stories about the Taliban to stories from the U.S., but that's not the world we live in anymore. So, if nothing else, I'm sure I'll have plenty to talk about next time. But until then, I'll hand you back over to Noah, Heat, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines, in Kansas news. Hey. When you consider all the theocratic bullshit the Supreme Court's doing, it's kind of hard to get excited about small secular victories on the municipal level. It's kind of like trying to reassure the person who's late to the meeting and can't find their keys by pointing out the relatively large number of personal belongings they haven't lost. (laughs) But at the risk of sounding like that guy, our next story is about a city council in a rural Kansas town voting to have the phrase in God we trust removed from the city's police vehicles. Fuck yeah, rural Kansas. We have four people and the mayor's a dog, but we don't need that theocratic <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Pretty much. We get the same amount of senators as California. Uh, They're both Republican. Sorry, f- I fucked it up. You, you guys were doing a positive <laughs> thing. Our mayor's name is Toto. He's adorable. <laughs> there oh, you go. He has a little hat. I'd have such a better mayor. A- anyway, so, so okay. This story comes to us from Haven, Kansas, tiny little town of about 1,200 people a half hour east of Wichita that had a full-blown Jesus freak as its chief of police. Our, sorry has a casual glance through the police department's Facebook page reveals several posts that unapologetically endorse Christianity and freely quote from the Bible. And a few months ago, Chief Stephen Schaefer graduated from government endorsements of religion online to government endorsements of religion on police cars with the now familiar addition of in God we trust decals on all the department's vehicles or I both of the department's vehicles. I, I'm not sure how many, but more than zero. Yeah. Hey, if I've done more expensive prank wars than your holy quest officer, you're just an <laughs> asshole putting bumper stickers on cop cars, okay? Yeah, Simpal Cindy was shockingly expensive. She was. <laughs> that was a lot. She was. Worth, worth it. it. <laughs> so, but anyway, that, believe it or not, came to an end last week when city council member Sandra Williams chimed in to point out that police cruisers and social media accounts were not, in her words, an appropriate forum to be talking about God. After a brief exchange between her and the chief, Schaefer asked directly if they wanted him to stop promoting Christianity. The council went on to vote unanimously that, yes, they'd like to continue enforcing (laughs) the First Amendment, regardless of the SCOTUS's feelings on the subject. Wow. And Schaefer agreed to have the decals removed and stop posting Jesus shit on the city's Facebook page. (laughs) Okay, do I still get to be a barely concealed, violent enforcer of the white Christian ethno state? Of course, Steve, you're not fired. We just want you to just <laughs> <laughs> taking off the stickers. Cool, cool, yeah. It's good you're not fired. Are you playing the, the circle below the waist punching game thing? I love that game. Oh, shit. 
I'm doing okay. <laughs> and as small as this victory obviously is, I think it's worth highlighting for two reasons. One is the reminder that even in Bumblefuck, Kansas, there are people who would rather not descend into abject theocracy. The other is that apparently this all started when a concerned citizen complained to Sandra Williams, which means that one lone voice actually did manage to get this small change done through the official channels. It's just an important reminder that even on the smallest scale, your involvement can make a difference. Of course, at the same time, the city's mayor is already waffling about the decision for fear of seeming anti-Christian to the electorate, so maybe it can't. But for now, we're going to err on the side of optimism. And in Mr. Gorbachev, prayer down this wall news. Huh. First of all, if you get that joke, your back hurts. Okay, it does. Second of all, you know, whenever the conversation about prayer in schools comes up, one right-wing politician or another has to paint this picture of a, a quiet teacher taking a moment of reflection for themselves when an atheist principal beats down the door and tases them in the butthole. <laughs> hey, Angelo, some uh, right-wing politicians could really use your help, so hop on it if you're feeling inspired. Exactly. Now, in reality, the opposite is almost always true. And we got another reminder of that this week when a Christian teacher with a prayer wall in her classroom tore down a non-Christian student's edition and then threatened that student with hellfire. Yeah, no, that's right, folks. This story started with a public school teacher having an in-classroom prayer wall. Then it got worse twice in the same sentence. <laughs> this is the America we're given to our children. <sighs> well, yeah. some people. No, not naming any names. Right. <laughs> so the teacher in question is Memorial High School biology teacher Amy Cook, who legally created a prayer room in the back of her class with Bible verses all over the walls. I guess in case any of the biology got him feeling dowdy. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, but here's what happened next, according to the Freedom From Religion Foundation's complaint. Quote, our complainant reports that four weeks after they placed a non-Christian prayer in the prayer room, asking to achieve their goals and to be kept safe by the gods and goddesses they believe in, Mrs. Cook pulled our complainant out of class and berated them for not being Christian. Mrs. Cook reportedly told our complainant that if they didn't repent, they would, quote, burn in hell and that she was required to intervene as a, quote, good Christian. Our complainant reports that Principal Grooms and Assistant Principal Vessel are aware of this illegal conduct, but have taken no action to correct it, end quote. Oh. Or as the New York Times podcast, The Daily would put it, the teacher stepped into the hallway for a quiet moment of personal religious reflection. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually gets worse. So not only is Amy Cook an obvious bigot who uses her teaching platform to proselytize, she's bragged about it when she ran for state Senate. So on her campaign website, amycook2022.com, she states, quote, as a parent, I was unaware of the dark cloud of corruption creeping into our school. And then I passed by a mirror and man, <laughs> it wasn't until I began to teach that I witnessed the spiritually damaging programs, liberal brainwashing and political indoctrination being slipped into our schools like biology. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. The means are clever and well funded. As a Christian, I could not remain silent. Silence equals permission. Yikes. Right. Wow. Yes. Yikes for so many, so many reasons. reasons. Yes. Fuck. But all of our follow up questions make us go, oh, yeah. Great segue to uh, sex ed talking. Uh, that's good. Oh, yeah. Amy Cook. I'm glad you brought that up because she that continues when the LGBTQ national mandate was forced under my students under the guise of sex with three X's. Jesus Christ. Education Idiot. in a two week class. I boycotted it and alerted all my students' parents. It was successfully taken away from most of the students' young eyes. Interesting. I continue to model my faith in God openly in my classroom because amidst all the confusion, I know where they will find true wisdom, strength, and love. Okay, just circling back. The sex ed was taken away from most of the students? Yeah. So, huh? so in her head... She helped groom a handful of students for pedophile stuff and eternal damnation, of course. That's a, that's a weird line in the sand. For us. <laughs> Jesus Christ. As a teacher, I successfully blocked children from learning and instead spread the gospel. I would love to be shocked by this, but you take it out of the first person and that might as well be like the Republican Party platform. They'd have a platform at that point. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> 
Damn it, you beat me to it. So, yeah, as usual, this is horrible. By the way, the principal is on record saying that they won't let Cook go because they're also a believer. Ooh. So the FFRF is probably going to have to take these assholes to court and then spend taxpayer money to get them to stop turning science class into mini church for kids. So I, I guess what I'm saying is next time your Uncle Frank or the New York Times' <laughs> daily podcast repeats some BS about the right to pray, send them this story. It won't matter, but... Honestly, if we only said stuff that changes people's minds, we wouldn't have a podcast. So. True, that's fair. And finally tonight, we have a story about Candace Taylor. Candy oh. T! Hey. Candy T, indeed. She's a Christian right Republican running for governor in Georgia, hoping to primary Brian Kemp. And her campaign slogan is, Candace Taylor, Jesus, guns, babies. Yep. Just that list of things. Well, she's been polling in third place for that primary. So she decided to become the champion of a big new issue, you know, shake things up. Lots of important political stuff going on in Georgia. So she decided to pick one of those very important things. And she's going to focus on blowing up some rocks with a bomb. That's where she landed. Hmm. She's calling for the demolition of the Georgia Guidestone. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. That's a monument of <laughs> granite slabs that went up in 1979 because this is why she wants to blow them up. She thinks they're part of a satanic plot or Illuminati plot or maybe a conspiracy by big granite to, to genocide most of the planet. Whatever. One of those groups wants to genocide most of the planet in her head. It, it's one of those. And if she's elected, she's going to blow up those fucking rocks. OK, taking your election playbook from ISIS. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see how that works out for her. <laughs> Jeez. Guys, we're like five inches away from candidates running on the and then we'll remove the gold fringe from the flags and they won't know what to do ticket. Hey, it's a platform. So <laughs> in response to this very pressing problem in the state of Georgia, KT unveiled a draft of her future executive order to destroy the Georgia Guidestones. For anyone who's not familiar, here's a quick background on what those things are. The tablets are mostly meant to be Basic information for anyone who survives a nuclear holocaust. For example, one of the tablets has engravings that note physical measurements of each stone so we can rediscover what inches and pounds are, I guess. One of the tablets acts as a sundial to show when it's noon. Another is facing the North Star. I'm not sure if any of this is going to be exactly accurate after a giant nuclear explosion yeah. nearby, but <laughs> that's the idea. All right, guys, we know where North is and what a foot is. But does anyone know what the shadow of the screaming guy means yet? <laughs> like is that mentioned? I mean, and, and it's in Georgia. I feel like the first thing they should do is add a stone about how truck nuts were decorative. It wasn't a species. <laughs> so we all know that plenty of Americans are terrified by science-y number stuff. I get it. But here's the part of the Guidestones that's really generating the controversy. There's a section of the Guidestones with... 10 Recommendations for the Age of Reason. And it's written in eight different languages. And this is the part that has crazy people like Candace Taylor and Alex Jones and, and a bunch of Christian leaders in a panic. She's not the first lunatic to bring this up, just the most recent. Here's the big problem spot. Recommendation number one for the Age of Reason says, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Now, just for the record, the population of the world in 1979 was about 4.4 billion. So the engraving is clearly referring to a scenario where the nuclear holocaust killed lots of people. But the crazy people think this is a public monument calling for a genocide. Ep, 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 Keith, let's hear the rocks out. <laughs> I would Christ. like to hear the rocks it's out. It's so weird how universally they seem to be against killing off major swaths of the world's population when you're not talking about environmental policy. But then... <laughs> Selective, yeah. What other thing here? Along with her plan to destroy the Guidestones, Taylor made a video standing in front of those tablets, and she says, the New World Order is here, and they told us it was coming. This is a battle. She also posted online, I am the only candidate bold enough to stand up to the Luciferian cabal. Jesus. <laughs> so, you sure are, Candace. Yeah, you are. Just to review. In Candace Taylor's head, she's running for governor of a state. In Candace Taylor's head, there's a satanic Illuminati plot to murder about 95% of the planet at this point that the conspirators wrote down on a giant stone, put it in public, yeah. and 
They'll stop the plan if she blows up those big rocks. <laughs> right. They won't know what to do anymore. Right. <laughs> there are notes. All right. Well, you can't summarize today's Republican Party better than a promise to blow up knowledge. So I guess we can close the headlines there. <laughs> Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, it'll be like we never left. And the dildos. We should talk about those. Oh, yeah, for sure. Guys, guys, I I've got some good news. Oh, what's that? We actually don't need to do the Adam and Eve ad this week. We don't? Yeah, it turns out Tim released a video of me and my outfit from the Toronto Live Show. And so our listeners are going to be sexually satisfied for a while. Trust me. No. Oh, okay. Y you mean the video of you in the Borat thong? I mean, Borat doesn't own that thong it's design. But yes, yeah, that's... But just in case, what's... AdamandEve.com. I'm telling you, you guys are wasting your time. They're the number one adult toy superstore. And right now, Adam and Eve is offering 50% off just about any item. But that's not all. When you get one item, they'll also send you three bonus sexy items and six free movies. Not that they'll need it because they already have that video of me. But I guess if you yeah. want to. Okay, we'll, we'll say that's true. Either way, Adam and Eve wants to make your life easy. They offer discreet shipping as your privacy is a priority. Plus, free shipping on your entire order. Doesn't matter how much you spend or what you buy. Everything is packaged and sent discreetly for free. That's 50% off one item and 10 free gifts to boot. And this exclusive offer is specific to this podcast. So be sure to use the code SCATHING to get not just the discount and the free goodies, but also the 100% free shipping. Use the code SCATHING. All right, guys. Thanks for the explanation. Hey, you know what? Maybe folks will use it after they cool down in a couple of months. M months, you think? Yeah, I mean, probably months, right? One of the dumbest ways that I've seen my life's work dismissed, and trust me, there are many, is the nonsensical <laughs> idea that one can't reasonably criticize one set of abuses unless they've also criticized all the other abuses. And as ridiculous as that argument seems when you boil it down to the X's and Y's, there are no end of people willing to dismiss our criticism of religion altogether because we haven't criticized literally every other untrue thing ever promoted by anyone. But in hopes of at least slightly deflating that nonsense in advance, we like to branch out into the wider world of fallacies in a segment that we call How Bullshit Is It? So tell us, Heath, what nugget of nuttery will we be nailing down today? Today, we're going to be talking about the Zeiten miracle. Okay, so if this is a miracle claim, shouldn't it be in our devil's advocate segment? Okay, I, I had to come up with something that started with a Z. Maybe just let it go on the technicalities. We could just... I just, I, just, I did a whole intro where I talked about how this segment wouldn't be about criticizing religious stuff. You, you, you wrote that after I told you what the topic was. Stop fighting, you're ruining my birthday party. Okay, fine, <laughs> fine. So what was the Zeiten miracle? Well, according to believers... It's a series of ghostly appearances of the Virgin Mary that took place over a church in Cairo, Egypt, between 1968 and 1971, and it was witnessed by millions of people. The witnesses included Christians, Muslims, Jews, and non-believers, and was even witnessed by then-president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser. It was investigated and confirmed by the head of the Coptic Orthodox Church, the Vatican, and the Egyptian government, and no non-miraculous explanation was found. Wow, that sounds pretty definitive. Mm -hmm. So how much of it's true? None, none of it's true. That, that would have been my guess. So what really happened? Oh, nothing. Nothing happened. Really? Well, <laughs> well, almost nothing. It's impossible to say for certain what, if anything, the witnesses saw, but the descriptions range from a faint halo over the top of the church to a full-blown Virgin Mary kaiju towering <laughs> over the church like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Huh. There were also witnesses that saw nothing whatsoever at the exact same times that other people were seeing the giant Virgin Mary kaiju and the inexplicable halos. And despite the claims about skeptics and atheists also seeing the apparition, there were exactly zero known witness accounts that were not from believers. Okay, I mean... Every description of a miracle sounds impressive if you lie about it initially. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so where does the story begin? Begins with Heath lying about what the miracle <laughs> is, apparently. So the first sighting came from two Muslim bus mechanics on April 2nd of 1968 who thought they saw a woman dressed in white on the roof of the St. Mary's Coptic Church in Zeiten. At first, they thought it was a nun about to commit suicide, 
So they started waving their arms and jumping up and down and yelling, don't jump. This drew a crowd, of course, and pretty soon there were a bunch of people squinting up at this figure. The police arrived on the scene a little bit later and tried to disperse the crowd. Now, the cop's explanation at the time, and almost certainly the reality of the situation, was that they were seeing a reflection of the light from the street lamps that was kind of vaguely person-shaped. But a church custodian offered the alternative explanation that it was a miraculous appearance of the Virgin Mary. Naturally, the crowd preferred the latter explanation. A few minutes later, the apparition disappeared. But hey, shout out to the guy who heard the cop explaining you're looking at a streetlight and was like, or, or, <laughs> maybe it's my God's mom and everyone owes me a dollar for looking. Yeah, huh? right. <laughs> so, so wait, that's it? No, not even close. The apparition reappeared a week later on April 9th and continued to appear intermittently for the next three years with increasing frequency. Sometimes she would show up two or three times in the same week. Okay, well, by the late 60s, we're very much into the photography era of human history. And yes, yes, given we are. the frequency of her appearances, you'd expect there to be plenty of photographic evidence of this miracle. Mm -hmm. So are, are there pictures? There are hundreds of pictures. Oh, wow. Uh, are any of them unambiguous and clearly undoctored? Well, y you'll be shocked to learn that no, not a single one was unambiguous and clearly undoctored. <laughs> so, that's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> the photos, like the witness accounts, are widely varied. Almost all of them are blurry, low quality, and out of focus. You would think that the very best photographers in the world would be the ones <laughs> taking them, right? Yeah. yeah, you'd think so. But no, mostly it was just randos snapping pictures from the streets, and that's that's what we got. Okay, podcast listener, I googled these photos for this segment. Your Uncle Frank's politics, five white claws into Thanksgiving, are clearer than these <laughs> fucking photos. <laughs> Wait, but so, so are there any clear pictures? Uh, there's a few, yeah. But they're obviously just illustrations drawn over the top of real photographs. Oh, Jesus. They also contain a lot of inexplicable elements. Like, for example, in the most well-known picture of the event, you can see sunlight very clearly reflecting on the heads of the people in the crowd, but the sky is dark <laughs> as though it was in the middle of the night. So you're saying all of the photos are fake? Okay, well, it's worth noting that Within a few weeks of the first sighting, pilgrims were arriving from all over the place with hopes of witnessing this miracle. And among the most popular souvenirs for these holy tourists were reprinted photographs of the event. So there was a financial incentive to fake pictures. The pictures we have would have been pretty easy to fake. And we don't know the source of any of the most popular and clear pictures. That's not exactly proof that they're all fake, but it's pretty strong evidence that they're all fake. Yeah, he's not saying that these photos of the Virgin Mary floating above a building aren't real. He's saying he's skeptical, everybody. He's skeptical, <laughs> well, asking questions. But Okay, but what about video? Yeah, that was a thing in the 60s, too, I think, right? Yeah. Did we, had, did we do video? Yeah. So according to the Wikipedia article, Egyptian television actually did catch the phenomenon on video. Wow. Huh. I bet that's among the most important and thus best preserved pieces of film in all of history, huh? Uh, there is no existing copy of the footage <laughs> and no record of it ever having even existed. Huh. But but they're pretty sure the Virgin Mary's head went back into the left and she is real, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. We don't have a tape of the Christine Chubbuck thing either, oh, so sometimes so, we miss the good it, it, So still, though... You said there were over a million witnesses, many of whom weren't Christian. That's got to count for something, no? No, no, I said that believers said there were over a million witnesses, oh. many of whom weren't Christian. Neither of those things appear to be true, though. Jesus. Okay, you liar, liar, he <laughs> then, right? <laughs> to be fair, there were lots of witnesses. There's no generally accepted number. Crowd size estimates are inexact to begin with. And these appearances generally happen at night, which doesn't exactly make counting the crowds any easier. But according to Christian authors trying to sell this as the real deal, in a single night, as many as a quarter of a million people would come out to see the event. Okay, all right, but the number of people who came out to see it and the number of people who saw it, <laughs> that's, that's not necessarily the same number, no? Well, you can just go ahead and leave out the word necessarily. It's not the same number. Okay, all right, but what about all those non-Christian people that were supposed to have witnessed it? Well, there are plenty of Muslim accounts, but... That's not in need of any special explanation. While they're not quite the fanboys that Christians tend to be of this, the Virgin Mary is a revered figure in the Islamic faith. But in terms of Jewish and atheist accounts, 
I didn't find any. Huh. According to the Wikipedia article, the only English language secular account comes from a professor of anthropology at the American University in Cairo named Cynthia Nelson. She visited the church on several occasions, including nights when the crowds claimed to have seen the ghost. What she saw was a few intermittent flashes of light, and sometime later she saw an ambiguous shape of some sort shining through some palm trees. So, <laughs> lights? Lights, yes. That's lights. it? <laughs> that That is the entirety of the secular count on the thing. Yes, it is. Honestly, it's a pretty good summary of any time a secular person got a good look at a miracle, so it tracks. <laughs> yeah. All right, so unexplained lights are a far cry from the Virgin Mary's ghost glowing its way around the church roof, but they're, they're still unexplained, no? Sure. There may well have been unexplained lights that occasionally appeared near that church, yes. But let's keep in mind that unexplained doesn't mean unexplainable. I mean, even if they were unexplainable, it still wouldn't be especially good evidence that the virgin mother of God's kid was appearing on top of an Egyptian church to wave at random crowds. But it's entirely possible that a perfectly mundane explanation was being overlooked. Like Catholic suggestion guy from earlier was up there flicking a fucking flashlight, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, was the source of the lights investigated? Technically, yes. But the highest profile investigation was undertaken by the Coptic Church itself. Huh. Which... It'd be kind of like Disney investigating whether their theme park really was the happiest place on Earth, scientifically. <laughs> but yeah, the head of the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, Pope Kirillos VI, appointed a committee of priests and bishops to investigate, led by the Bishop of Postgraduate Studies, Coptic Culture, and Scientific Research. He's that's, got all of those, huh? That's, a, that's an apartment, <laughs> I guess. And to nobody's surprise, that person confirmed that it was genuinely miraculous and no alternative explanation could possibly be found. Huh. This reminds me an awful lot of when that committee of our moms did that investigation of who had the funniest podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine said it was Cognis. It was, that was <laughs> <That's> rough. <terrible. laughs> that was rough. So, okay, was that the only investigation? Well, the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism also issued a validation. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah they validated. <laughs> Although it's unclear if they did their own investigation or if they just relied on the one the Coptic Church did. What is clear is that the same ministry immediately started printing up pamphlets and distributing them as far and wide across the Christian world as they possibly could. Okay, so I get that they're not exactly sending skeptics, but what about the Catholic Church? Right. I mean, sure, they've got a vested interest in validating miraculous appearances of Mary, but not on other people's churches. Right. So so did <laughs> yeah. they do any kind of investigation? They did not. No, hmm. no, they did not. But apparently their lack of investigation didn't stop them from also validating this miracle. I guess they decided the denominational rivalry was less important than having a 20th century miracle to celebrate. Uh, yes, the mother of God is obviously our religion, but she... Visits the other ones sometimes. <laughs> Come on, guys. She's only 15. Give yeah, her right. a break. Uh, give her she a break. Know the difference. All right. So I guess this is a pretty open and shut case, but I, I have one lingering question. So correct me if I'm wrong, but Egypt is like overwhelmingly Muslim. No, it is. Yeah. Between 90 and 95 percent, depending on the source. OK, so, yeah. So even though Mary is still a revered figure in their religion, it seems like if the government's going to throw their weight behind a miracle claim, it's not going to be one that validates Christianity. I mean, we're talking about the leading lady in the Christian faith. She's appearing on top of a Christian church. The investigation is being done by Christian authorities. It just seems odd that the government of a Muslim majority nation would lend so much credence to a minority faith. Sure. Yeah. But to really understand the situation, you need to consider when it happened historically. Oh, uh, the day after April Fool's. It was a prank war. Was it a prank <laughs> war? <laughs> Probably not. But it did happen in 1968, less than a year after Egypt got its ass handed to it in the Six Day War, or as it's known in Egypt, the setback of 1967. <laughs> oh, really? That was a not quite week long war between Israel and an Arab coalition that included Egypt, Syria and Jordan. And it's one of the most lopsided military defeats of the 20th century. The Egyptians alone lost between 10 and 15,000, where Israel lost between 776 and 983. Jesus. Israel also seized the West Bank at that point, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip, which the world is still dealing with today. Okay, wait. So their theory was that the Virgin Mary was coming to rally the troops and kick some Jewish ass? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but there was a sort of cultural crisis that reverberated all through Egyptian society in the aftermath of that war setback thing. President Nasser wasn't exactly a democratically elected leader, but the humiliation was so overwhelming that even he felt the need to resign in disgrace. And then out of nowhere, a series of spontaneous protests against his resignation <laughs> kept him oh, in power. Really? It was so weird. But it was at least bad enough that they felt the need to stage a resignation. He's just like, okay, uh, we get it. Uh, Jews are still mad about the shmishma. <laughs> uh, I think we'll, they'll probably just calm down and go back to being super friendly in a couple of years, guys. We'll just, uh, how long could this last? <laughs> <laughs> right. So following that whole ordeal, there was a widespread feeling throughout the country that the defeat came as the result of Egyptians having abandoned their faith in favor of man-made ideas and belief systems. This supposed miracle was probably an extension of that religious revivalism. Sociologists Robert Bartholomew and Eric Good explained it as a classic example of mass hysteria. According to Bartholomew and Good, quote, it appears that the Marian observers were predisposed by religious background and social expectations to interpreting the light displays as related to the Virgin Mary, end quote. Okay, so so what we're left with here is just unexplained lights. Unexplained lights. Yes, we are. That is it. And I should emphasize here that there's no consensus suggesting that these lights were in need of explanation in the first place. The secular account I quoted from before wasn't some anthropologist saying, but what the fuck were those lights? It was more like, but but they're just, they're just flashes of light. Flashes of light happen. There's distant lightning, airplanes over clouds, shooting stars, just lots of photons flying around. They're all over the place. (laughs) Also, keep in mind that Zaitan is a district in Cairo, a city that had a population over 5 million at the time. So we also have to include all the sources of light typical for a very large city. Oh, so, okay. So then what we're left with is, is nothing. Nothing, (laughs) yes. Not even lights. Well, I guess the only question left to ask is... How bullshit is it? Okay, so there's the obvious lie, followed by the investigation by liars, followed by, shut up, we're done. Why are you bringing up old shit? It's done. (laughs) So at least three levels of lying. It's bullshit cubed. So I'm going to say it's wombat shit crazy levels. Okay. Ooh. Interesting. Wombat shit cubes. All right. Well, if I'm tallying that correctly, that means it's secularism, infinity, spiritualism, zero. But, but it's halftime only. No, it's halftime. <laughs> yeah. And somehow that score is going to get even worse on the next installment of How Bullshit Is It? Before we fade to black tonight, I want to remind you that Matreon is the best time to become a patron. Be sure to check the show notes for a handy dandy link to our Patreon page and our Matreon page as well, where you can keep track of all our goals. And thanks in advance. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. Again, with that long be to look up for a brand new episode of our sister show's hot friend got off a of movie being at 7 Eastern on Tuesday and an even newer episode of our half sister show citation needed day being at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be a worse host than those Jesus crackers if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for his height, Eli Bosnick for his depth, and Lucinda Illusions for her Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Love and companionship. I also need to thank Matthew for providing this week's Farnsworth quote, but most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most matrionic mammals... Jeff, Max, Mockingbird, Nation, Natalie, Chris, it's time to change your name to Scatman, Dan, you promise, Dave, Ryan, Ray, Roy, Random, Van Gogh, Kaylee, Coyote, Stardust, Matt, Yolanda, Joe, Ethan, Tanya, Travis, Lindsay, Logan, Ancient, Serve, Soft, Snackies for Quiet, Breakies, Eli's Future, Cellmate, Ann, Jerry, Crystal, Weirden, Mirden, Jane, JD, BT, DM, Kevin, Tom, Tommy, Fiddlesticks, Carl, Mr. Ern, Olivia, Adrian, Dallin, Eric, The Bug, and Anastasia. <sighs> Whose generosity is so big it had to annex territory from the Genera County around it. Get it? I'm so proud of that joke. Anyway, together, these 44 fantastic freethinkers flunk philanthropic funds to our foul mouth fuckery this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some of it to us, but you might, and you might even force us to eat vegan crap or trigger a magic show or something if you donate now. You can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you don't have the money to spare, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, or following at PIAT pod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also rolled in music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingads.com. I 
ran this ad by her. Okay, so good. I'm glad. Yep, yep. I'm glad. Excellent. She'll be this up. <laughs> I, I, and I'm also glad that she doesn't appear in the Adam and Eve ad. Like, I'm glad that we stuck <laughs> to the Auburn's yeah, ad. That you know, one she turns down. Yeah. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.